Now, a question that I get quite frequently is, Tanner, do you work on other people's cars? Will you work on my car? Can you fix my car? Short answer is yes. So today I've got a special treat for you guys. We are fixing head gaskets on a 2007 STI. Now I'm gonna do this video as a DIY, how to fix head gaskets, reseal your engine from the ground up. As you guys can see, the motor's still fully intact, still in the car. Now I'm gonna glaze over removing the engine only because I have a full video showing you guys step-by-step step how to remove the engine, which I'll link right there. So get to that point, understand what you need to do to pull the motor. I'll briefly run through it in this one as I'm pulling this engine out. And then I'll show you guys the process to replace your head gaskets, reseal the engine, do everything you need to do to refresh a Subaru to get it 100% back to being road ready. So let me show you this one real quick. Now I was in a meeting all morning, so I already jacked the car up. I let the oil drain out, the coolant drain out. As you can see, I spilled a little little bit of it right there, but I caught most of it. Um, you can tell this car has been serviced in a while because it still has green coolant in it. Personally, whenever I do older Subarus like this, I don't use green, I use blue. Any Subaru that used green coolant can use blue coolant. Any Subaru that uses blue coolant cannot use green coolant, all right? Just keep that in mind. So um, this one, we're gonna be swapping it over to blue. So as you guys can see, everything is intact. The only modifications I really see to this thing are a downpipe, AOS, um, and some engine dress up parts here and there, and the intake, obviously. So, this should be fun. The way I'm going to do this intake will come out, top mount intercooler will come off, downpipe will come off, I'll take the intake manifold out, um, battery obviously will come out, and then from there, I'll take the engine out of this thing. So, let me just get started on removing this engine. Like I said, if you don't know how to remove these engines, I'll put a link right here as I get all of that stuff stripped out. As I said, um, I'll kind of run through the basics with you guys of how to take the engine out of the car. Hey guys, so I'm at the point now where I'm ready to pull the engine out. Remember, I go through all of this stuff, every single step to get to this point in the video that I linked up there. So, um, now that we're ready to pull the engine out, just a couple things as a friendly reminder. Engine grounds, O2 sensors, make sure all of that stuff is disconnected so that way it doesn't get caught up on anything as you're pulling it out. Turbo, downpipe, all that's out. You don't have to go to the extent of taking the intake manifold and whatnot off. I just prefer doing it that way. I find it to be a little bit easier to be working with a bare engine when pulling this thing in and out of the car. So, now that everything is disconnected, ready to come out um, we're gonna get this engine out of here take off the pressure plate and get this thing up on an engine stand so that way we can start breaking down the front uh, timing cover and getting like the exhaust manifold everything like that out uh, I'm assuming that the AVCS or the cam gear bolts are going to be seized on there so hopefully I don't have to drill them out if I do have to drill them out it's not the end of the world we can get replacements from Subaru so let's get oh and one more big thing don't forget to take the slide pin out for the clutch fork or else the engine and transmission will not separate from each other. So make sure you get that guy out. The threads on the end of it are just M6 by one. So you can use like an intake manifold bolt if you want to. Um, it's a 10 mil. So let's get this engine out of this thing. Let's bring this thing back to life. Hey guys, so the easy part's done. Engine's out of the car, it's on the stand, it's ready for us to work on it and get the heads off. Now, I know what you're thinking. I just said that was the easy part because that is the easy part. The hard part is getting the cam gears off of the cams. So, I've tried a different couple techniques in the past to try not to destroy them. The, not the cams or the cam gears, but the bolts that hold them on. They're stupid 10 mil Allens. And when they round, you're screwed. So, 
I'm gonna hit them with some heat off of my propane torch um, just to get them to loosen up a little bit and then try using my half inch electric impact to zap them straight out of there. I'm gonna do it with the timing belt on so that way um, they stay under load so that way it's not gonna try to spin the engine or anything like that. So, so to access those, you're gonna need to take the crank pulley off. This is a 22 millimeter. I used a half inch impact, it's loose, I can pull it off now. Then you're gonna have to take off these rear timing covers. After you get the rear timing covers off, then we can get down to the timing belt stuff. I'm replacing the timing belt water pump, pulleys, tensioner, everything timing related on this car, except for the cam gears, uh, because those are still totally fine to reuse. After we get those off, then we'll progress past that. But um, let me try a couple different techniques to get these cam gears off. I have the company 23 tools, but if it comes down to it, I'll just have to wait until Matt comes home to help me because this is uh, definitely not gonna be a one person job if I have to use those tools. All right, so we were able to break three out of four loose, which isn't bad by using the impact. They fucking, they came literally right out nice and loose. This bottom left one down here is a little bit locked up and a little bit seized, but um, now we can start pulling off all these pulleys. I like to take off this bottom one first. That releases tension on the belt. We're replacing all these pulleys, so I'm gonna throw all the pulleys in the garbage, but make sure you guys do keep the bolts. I just like to put them back in wherever they go. At this point, you can remove the belt. Uh, I'm just going to pull the rest of the pulleys off real quick, just to gonna get them out of the way, and then the belt will just come right off. Pull the tensioner off. That cam gear is always sprung. If it does that, don't freak out. So now that we have the majority of the cam gears off, um, God, dude, this, one, this one's probably also sprung, so it's probably going to flip out a little bit too as soon as I get this belt off. Now, these two cams over here on the left side of the engine for what, how we're looking at it, or the passenger side, these two should rotate by hand totally fine. These ones over here may feel like this one still has, this one definitely still has tension on it. Oop, yep, there we go. So now you can rotate them all by hand. These two will always have tension on them when you go to pull these off. Now do keep in mind that these bolts for these cam gears are different if you have a single AVCS like this. The AVCS gears right here, these bolts have a hole in them to allow oil to pass through them for the oil control valves to actuate the AVCS. So if you guys look at the end of the bolt, you'll see a hole that goes from the bottom all the way through the head of it. Well, now that we've got this side at least exposed, off this exhaust manifold and the up pipe, First thing that we want to do before we even start trying to take this thing off is get everything out of the way that we don't need. It's going to be this oil pickup tube or the oil fill tube, both the coil packs, this oil control valve line right here, which is just an oil line. So uh, this is all held on by three 10 mils right here. Both the coil packs are two 12 mils. All the valve cover bolts are all 10 mils. I believe there's nine of them plus the two cam cap carrier bolts. Um, and then the bolts for the oil feed lines for the cylinder head and the AVCS are 17 mils. So let's take all this off so that way we can get this guy off. Sometimes doesn't want to come off. Uh, doesn't look terrible. I'm gonna run the covers and whatnot through my parts washer, but it doesn't look bad. I've seen worse. I've seen better, but I've also seen worse. Okay, now this is the part that you need to be very careful with. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and get this guy just out of the way, this old gasket or this old sealer. Uh, you may find that the person before you may have put RTV down underneath the gasket. That's totally fine. We all do it. Um, it helps seal the valve cover to the cylinder head just a little bit better. Let me get ready to dive into these cams. As you guys can see, um, make sure you're obviously there's no physical damage. Make sure the cams rotate by hand. Everything feels nice and smooth. You need to be very careful at this point because after you take these cam caps off, you need to make sure you do not turn this engine over or spin the engine stand. If these valve buckets underneath of these cams fall out, 
you are totally screwed and you have to play figure out what bucket goes where. All of the buckets underneath of these cam lobes are specific sizes measured out for that valve. If you go around and you start messing with them and you start changing them, you're gonna de just destroy your valve lash. Now at this point you need to be very careful for a couple of reasons. Um, a, you need to make sure that these cam caps go back into the same spots that they came out of. If you look at the cam, these are labeled and so is the cylinder head. This one says 774774. On these back ones, you've got 4E774. It's gonna be cylinder four, exhaust, cylinder head number 774. It even has an arrow telling you which way to put it. So even if you get these mixed up and you don't know where they go, they are all labeled for you. So that way you physically cannot put them in the wrong spots. So let's go ahead and pop off this cam carrier here and these cam caps here. You're gonna wanna inspect the journals to make sure that there's no damage on them if you've recently had engine failure. Um, if you're just doing this as a refresh, rehead gasket or resurface, anything like that. Um, it doesn't hurt to inspect them but you're probably fine for the most part. So uh, let's go ahead and get our cams removed out of here. So that way we can get ready to get these sent over to the machine shop. Take out the exhaust cam. They should just pull right out like that. And take off the intake cam. Comes right off. So the spark plugs should just be a 16 mil. Use the lowest setting if you're using an impact. You don't need to go ham. These spark plugs look a little old. So now comes the fun part where you're gonna start taking all these guys out. Now, if you're lucky, I don't know if I'm going to be, you can use a half inch impact. If not, you're gonna have to do it with a breaker bar, but it's all right if it comes down to it. So um, I'm gonna go in reverse order of installing. So it's gonna be top left, bottom right, bottom left, top right, bottom middle, top middle. This head is ready to come off. Let me grab my mallet so that way we can get this thing off. Couple love taps, nothing crazy. Just a couple love, love taps, just like that. And cylinder head comes off and there's our head gasket. So right here on the head gasket, you can see that the material has vanished there. Um, it's starting to disappear here also. Uh, and it's just starting to wear in a couple other spots. So uh, my guess is that some of the compression was getting into the cooling system. He did say he saw bubbling uh, getting into the coolant. So yeah, these head gaskets are pretty toast. How's the side look? So he's lucky that was early onslaught signs of head gasket failure. He caught it before any like major, major, major damage happened. I am actually going to toss that cylinder head that we just pulled off. This one, I'm gonna put all this into the parts washer real quick, just get it ready to be taken over to the machine shop in the morning. Let me run through and clean all this real quick. I'm not even gonna film it because you guys don't care. Let me go clean this. There it is. Now give me my cam gear. Fuck dude, that sucks. This thing sucked to drill out. And look at that. Literally just on threads as soon as you get the head off. All right, my friends, so we have the short block torn down to literally just the short block and oil pan. I'll take the oil pan off tomorrow and reseal that and then get that back on there. So we're gonna set this aside for now. We're not gonna do anything with this for a little while. Now over here, I've got both of the cylinder heads. We're gonna end up taking out all of the valves and springs. We're gonna relap all of these valves. Uh, we're gonna replace the valve stem seals on all of these. And then we're gonna drop these off at the machine shop tomorrow. The machine shop is gonna go through. They're gonna resurface the heads. If you don't know what that means, they are going to deck this surface here that mates up to the head gasket so that way it's perfectly flat. I highly suggest you guys deck heads. I've seen people not deck heads and then have to go back through, disassemble everything again and redeck the heads. So make sure you guys are decking the heads. Over here, when it comes to disassembly of the heads, I decided to, dis to disassemble them. I label all the buckets. So if you guys see here, this one says RH, I N four. This is right hand intake four. And then I just put them on this like paper towel. I label like this is the front of head, front of the head. This is the passenger head. Uh, this is the driver's head. This is the front of the head. So over here, it's like 
Uh, left hand intake, one, two, three, four, exhaust, one, two, three, four. Same with the cams, valve covers, everything like that. So we're gonna keep these set aside for now. We're gonna jump over here. Now I've got a whole video showing you guys how to rebuild head, so I'm not gonna walk you through the boring stuff on it, but if you don't have this tool, get it. It is a Company 23 valve spring compressor tool with a little cup. I found that the easiest way to get valve keepers back in is between these two tools, little tweezers, and then this little magnetic screwdriver guy here. So let me go through here, relap all these, clean up all this stuff, and get these guys ready to go to the machine shop tomorrow morning. All right, you guys, it is the next day. So I've already taken the heads to the machine shop and got them back to be resurfaced resurfaced and checked and they are good to go for what we're doing. So uh, before we even go to get the cylinder heads on, since I'm resealing this entire engine, I'm gonna flip this thing over and uh, do the oil pan real, real quick like. So I'm gonna pull off all the bolts, take off all the old gasket maker, get the new gasket maker on there. Uh, I need to pull off the oil pump seal as well because we're replacing that. Um, Every single seal on this engine is getting replaced. So let's flip this thing over and let's do the oil pan. Then I'll show you guys these heads. and gentlemen it's time to get these heads back on here and get our new head gaskets in so um, I went through I cleaned off the pistons a little bit I just got the oil pan sealed back up I took it completely apart I cleaned it all to make sure that there was nothing in there uh, ran it all through the parts washer got all the old oil staining off of it so now we do the head gasket. So before you go slapping your head gasket on, there is a correct orientation for this thing. This is the wrong way how I have it now. As you can see, the oil port over here is not lined up with the oil port here. You do wanna make sure that the two oil ports are lined up. It's, only, it's really only gonna line up one way where all of the cooling jackets, all the oil ports are going to match up. You've got the two locating dowels here, here that will keep everything centered and in line. Now before you go putting the head on and everything like that, make sure you clean the surface. All of this old staining you see you can try to scrub at it for as long as you want, but without taking a little bit of material off, it's just gonna be there. Don't stress it, it's gonna seal just fine. So, oil port to oil port. Now for us, we're not using head bolts anymore. We're using ARP head studs. If you have your engine torn apart and you're at this point, I highly suggest using ARP head studs, just ARP 2000s. Just use ARP 2000 head studs. It's gonna, it's just, it makes life easier. Head studs are just better than head bolts in my opinion. So let me grab our head studs real quick. I'm gonna get them all cleaned off and we're gonna get them threaded into the six ports here on the block with the provided ARP lubricant for it. Uh, and then we can get our head sat back on here and start getting things reassembled. And you don't need a lot of this stuff. Like you're just putting a very light coat of this lubricant onto these threads. This just helps with getting the torque value accurate when tightening all this down. You should have a lot of this stuff left over by the time you're done. Like you're not gonna use this whole packet. So just to show you guys, we have our freshly decked cylinder head here. I'll show you guys the other one before we put it on. It's as easy as literally sliding it on. Make sure that everything's lined up. And it should just go down like that. Now at this point, I like to give it a couple love taps with just a rubber mallet, just to get it all to seat into the dowels. You don't gotta be aggressive with it. Now if you're using head bolts, this is where you'd put the bolts in. If you're using head studs like me, we have a couple extra steps. All right, so first we're just gonna go through, we're gonna put all of our washers over all of our head studs here. One, two, come on, get on there, daddy-o. And once you have all the washers on, if this one wants to cooperate like that, you're gonna put a little bit of this ARP lubricant on the bottom side of the nut 
on the face of it. Just a little bit, you don't need a lot, like I said. You should have a lot of this stuff left over by the time you're done. And as you do those, you can start to hand thread them on. I'm just gonna get them hand started for now. You just, you legit just need like a nice light layer of this stuff. Don't coat it, don't cake it, absolutely no need. So, so now I've got all these hand started. Now it's time to torque all these down. And there is a sequence and a torque, se there's a torque sequence and torque specs you need to follow when doing this. Uh, so I'm gonna start off by just running these guys down. I need to get an extension. So we're gonna start off by just running these guys down on the lowest setting of your impact. Now ARP gives you this paper for the torque sequence and the settings for these bolts. So the torque sequence is going to be one, two, three, four, five, six, okay? So we're gonna start out at 30 pounds, 60 pounds, and then 90 foot pounds on all of these in that order. Six. So we got one head torqued down. Look at that, daddy-o. Now that we got this one torqued down, I'm gonna do the exact same thing on the other side before we start reassembling these heads, just to get these heads back on here. Congratulations, you have replaced your head gasket. So at this point, we're gonna go back through here, we're gonna clean everything up in the heads, get our buckets back in there, our cams back in there, cam caps, everything like that to get the head sealed up. Then we can get this thing timed, get it thrown back in the car. Now, biggest thing here is make sure everything's clean when you go do this. You don't want crap hanging out in here. As long as you organized all of your buckets and all of your bolts and everything, you'll know exactly where they go. So. Let's start throwing all this stuff back in so that way we can get this thing timed to back in the car. I want to get the engine back in the car tonight so that way tomorrow we can wrap this thing up. You guys, we are back for day three on our head gasket job here on this Hawkeye. So last night I went through, I got everything timed. I have this engine ready to go back in. I've got the exhaust manifold on, got the up pipe on, crossover, coolant, all the good stuff is back on this thing, ready to be dropped back in. Before I put it back in though, I need to get the engine hoist, pick this thing up. I am going to replace the rear main seal also because it's a full reseal. We don't skimp out on any gaskets. I advise you do the same when you have your engine out. Replace every gasket, every seal, literally everything to ensure that your refreshed engine is not going to leak because that's the last thing that you want. We're gonna pop this guy off. We're gonna get it up on an engine stand, get that flywheel off, that old rear main seal out, get the new one in. And I wanna show you guys a special tool that Company 23 just came out with for that rear main seal because it makes your life so easy trying to get that rear main seal in versus having to use like a punch or a PVC pipe or a block of wood, just buy the right tools for the job. And like I said, I'll link below all the tools I'm using, as well as all the gaskets, seals, sealants, everything like that, fluids, to make your guys' life easy so that way you're not trying to hunt these parts down. So, let's get this rear main seal done, get this engine back in. All right, you guys, now I'm gonna show you one of my favorite tools. So this is actually, Company 23 just sent me this. Uh, this is their rear main seal installer tool. If you've ever had to do a rear main seal in a Subaru, normally you do it with like a pick, a block of wood or something. This makes life way easier. So we're gonna get our rear main seal just lined up here. With it lined up like that, we're gonna go ahead and get this bad beezy installed. All right, you guys, so when it comes to installing the rear main seal with this tool, you don't wanna do like one bolt all the way in and then another bolt all the way in. You wanna do like even pressure as you go around this. So I'm gonna start on the bottom because I know I got the top in a decent way, so I'm gonna get everything snugged up to start with. Yeah, that's beautiful! 
That looks so fucking good. Dude, company 23 for the win, man. All right, you guys, so I'm gonna get the uh, flywheel pressure plate, everything bolted back on. Let's get this engine back in the car. Now, a couple quick things before you go slapping this guy in. Make sure that you've got the throwout bearing off of the clutch and make sure you've got it set up in the transmission. So your throwout bearing is going to slide over the output shaft or the input shaft. The clutch fork is going to slide in there and then the slide pin goes in. Make sure you do put some molly grease on that stuff to make your life a little bit easier. Now, the trick to getting these Subaru engines in is getting the engine and the transmission to the same angle. So what I normally do is I put a, just a normal car jack underneath of the transmission to jack it up to the height or the angle that I need. So that way, I can adjust it to match the angle of the engine. So, this bad boy in here. Let's get this thing running. back in now like i said it's all about angles sometimes you got to take it out and then put it back in and it just slides right in the first time i tried to put this thing in it did not want to line up with the transmission pulled it back out put it back in and it literally just slid right into the trans and bolted right back up so that's awesome uh, i've also got our starter secondary air injection pump and heater core lines put back in over here whenever it comes to reassembly on these things i like to start from like one corner and work my way around um, i'm at the point now where i need to get the turbo on but i need a turbo to up pipe gasket because for some reason the oem subaru kits don't come with them like i don't know why they don't give you turbo to up pipe gasket or turbo to down pipe gasket for an engine reseal it doesn't make sense to me so i need to go run down to subaru go grab one of these crusty old guys and then a turbo to down pipe gasket also and then we can start getting things back together just like that with the power of editing i've returned with two gaskets like i said i'll link everything down below so that way you guys don't have to overpay for gaskets so let's get this turbo back in this intake manifold back on and uh get this car running i want to have it running by like 4 35 o'clock and it's like 1 30 now This has been a journey that we've embarked on together. And now look at that. We have an engine back together. It's like we never took it apart. So uh, like I said, every single gasket, every single seal in there is all fresh. Now, if you go to the extent of replacing the oil pump, we did not. Make sure you do prime the oil system to get oil pre going through the pump. After you have oil going through the pump, you're totally fine. If you don't replace the pump, you do not have to prime the oil system. I already did in this. You do that by disconnecting the crank position sensor and disconnecting the fuel pump. So that way you're not injecting a ton of fuel into the car. So now that we're ready to go, we need to burp the cooling system. Remember, you took this engine completely apart. Coolant needs to get back everywhere where it was before that it is no longer at. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna turn the car on. You're gonna turn the defrost on high, all the way high and all the way max. That's gonna help push any air out of the heater core. You're also going to, if you have an access port, pull up coolant temp so that way you can monitor what your coolant temps are. Double check everything, make sure everything's plugged in, everything's good to go, make sure you have enough oil in there. We're gonna be checking the oil and the coolant as it's burping. And then after we turn the car off, we're gonna let it sit for five to 10 minutes to let all that oil get back down into the sump and then we'll take our reading. I have about 5.5 quarts in there right now. That's about what the pan takes. So. Let's turn this thing on and see how it does. All right, how is our fresh STI? 
It's totally refreshed at this point, so it better be good. I'm gonna prime the fuel system a couple times, just to double check. While it's doing this, make sure you're checking for leaks. It sounds really good. It sounds very smooth. Go. All right, I'm gonna let it idle, and we'll get the, all the coolant burped. I'll take this thing around the block, and we'll see how she drives. Assuming everything is good, we'll let the customer come pick it up. a little bit of PB blaster off the exhaust manifold. So, um, let's let this thing idle. It'll smoke off any of that old grease on anything hot. It should be good. It's idling a lot smoother now than when it came in. So, give me like five minutes to get this thing burped. Hey guys, so, um, car idles fantastic. Everything seems fine. No, no more smoking of anything. The JB, JB weld, the PB blaster all burned off. So, I got a couple loose ends to tie up in here and then uh, we can get this thing buttoned up and go take it for a test drive around the block real quick. So finish up the last couple things. All right, we are all buttoned back up and good to go. All fluids are good. We got oil in, coolants burped. That thing is looking pretty minty for an STI with 130K on the clock. Um, freshly resealed and everything good to go again. So let me move the race car real quick. <laughs> good to go good to drive on the street again brand new refreshed well it's not brand new ej25 but refreshed ej25 look at that not too bad realistically it's like two days worth of work if you include machine time in there if you had a fresh set of heads to do it all in the same day you totally could gets in a boost Perfect! Look at that, you guys! It's really not bad to go through and refresh an engine like this. I think it's really not bad at all. Idle is very smooth now. Feels good. All right, you guys, so it's the next day. I have some unfortunate news. That car that we just refreshed, it didn't make it home. So, unfortunately, the worm gear clamp on the lower radiator hose failed on his drive home. And all of the coolant came out of the radiator, it all came out of the engine, and it all spilt everywhere. Now, this could have been prevented to save the engine, and I'm not knocking the owner for this because he is younger and he is still learning. His coolant temps reached about 250 degrees and he drove about two to three miles with temperatures that high. When you drive a car that hot for that long, it's going to do a lot of damage to the engine. It was, it was This is why I just try to avoid worm gear clamps as much as possible. I really prefer OEM spring clamps versus any aftermarket clamp. T-bolts for fluids suck. Worm gears suck. OEM is the way. So last night I drove out there on the side of the freeway. I tried to help him get his car running. I was hoping for the best when I got out there, but unfortunately uh, the coolant expansion tank did turn into a water fountain, which is a key sign that the head gaskets failed significantly because it's shooting all that compression into the cooling system and trying to blow that coolant out of the coolant expansion tank. And it's unfortunate that it did happen. Car was smoking a little bit. Uh, coolant temps were getting up. He said he first noticed when coolant temps got around like 230. Uh, 
Um, and then he kept an eye on it, got to, could just kept going up, up to 250. Um, like I said, two to three miles on that, it'll just, it'll demolish an engine. Anything past to like at maximum, anything past 212 degrees, pull the car over, shut it off, and see what's going on in that in that engine bay because that's not normal. Thermostat opens at 185 degrees, your fans kick on at 205 degrees, and then as soon as your fans kick on, they should start bringing temperatures back down. So, like I said, shit happens. On top of that, I'm pretty confident that that short block is now toasted. With driving at 250 degrees for that long, that's, that's gonna cause some damage. Now, it could have been prevented, yes, I understand. If he would have caught coolant temps when they got around 210 to 212, pulled over, turned off the car, it would have been as easy as putting the hose back on with a new clamp and reburping the cooling system, the car would have been fine. But the fact that he didn't know, it's unfortunate, it happens, it's a learning lesson. I felt bad for him, I ended up giving him back half of his money that he paid to have everything resealed to go towards a new short block or a new whatever he decides to do with it. I'm gonna help him as much as I can because I feel bad. I feel for him. I've been there before when I was younger. I have a spare EJ back there that I offered to build him free of charge on the labor side if he covers the parts cost for it and I'd help him do the labor on reinstalling a new block into the car. So I feel for him. I'm going to try to help him as much as I can. But when, when things like that happen, you, you got to be attentive to what's going on with the car. You, you just can't drive a car with coolant temps that high. And I don't want to see any negative comments down below in the comment section bashing this dude or saying anything negative about him. I rarely delete comments, but I will delete comments anything negative about the owner of the car. I'm not going to say who he is. I'm not going to say anything like that. So don't be a dick. If you're a dick, I'll delete your comment. And I'm 100% confident that hose clamp was tightened down when it left here. If it was, if it wasn't, it would have been leaking when we burped to the car and it would have been leaking when we drove it and coolant temps would have started going up. So um, it's unfortunate that the clamp failed. Um, he's understanding of it. He, he understands that it's not my fault. It's not, it's, it's no one's fault. Shit happens sometimes. So like I said, I'm going to work with him as much as I can to try to help him out and save him a little bit of money. Like I said, he's younger, um, still learning. So shit happens. But that is all I got for you guys on this one. Um, refreshing an engine is really not hard. It's not bad. Um, take your time, go through there, make sure you're every, doing everything spot on. Make sure that everything is tightened down, torqued down. You got no leaks or anything like that. And after a major service like that, be attentive to what is going on with the engine. Keep an eye on everything for a little while at least, just to make sure that you don't go through a similar situation because I hate to see that happen to, at, to literally anybody out there. So that's all I got for you guys. If you like the video, you know what to do. Go to hit that like button, turn black, blue, green, yellow, purple, silver, cyan, whatever color it turns for you. And if you're not already subscribed to the channel and you wanna be one of these corners, no idea which one I'll put it in quite yet. But with that, peace out, homies. Woo!